Hey, good afternoon. So lecture number 10. Uh, so today we're going to close the discussion about the hydraulic modeling. And to that end, I would like to introduce you several different component models. And the models that I'm about to introduce you are a throttle valve, which is a very simple hydraulic component model. And then uh, main body of today's uh, description and explanation is directed to direction valve, which is um, um, operated by, by magnets, something that is currently heavily used. And then uh, shortly, which will be more or less your reading assignment, will be a pressure relief valve, and then of course, cylinder and a pump. So those will be the, the, the components that we need to kind of uh, describe to be able to model the hydraulic circuit. And then once we're done with that, then I, I do have an example, which is a, how is it we can model from beginning all the way to end a hydraulic circuit. But before we get started, I have a two practical announcements that I would like to do. So next week, I have a little bit of hard time to deliver you a lecture during the user lecture time, which is on Wednesdays, Wednesday afternoon. So what I'm hoping to do is that I would like to give you, I would like to deliver a lecture next week on Thursday, which is 25th, 25th of November, 25th of November. And if it also, if it is okay to you, I would like to use the usual time. So at 4 p.m. That's when we're gonna get, I mean, that's when the streaming will be on. My lecture will be on at uh, 4.15. And that's gonna be the last online lecture. As uh, be, That's simply because the last one, this lecture ID 12, which is gonna be the ultimately the last lecture of this class, that's gonna be as promised that that will be organized in the lecture room. And uh, then we will see face to face. Those of you that would like to see me face to face, of course, there will be a streaming option available too. So if you're unwilling to see me face to face or you're having a hard time to travel to La Peranta, that, that will be okay too. So you can follow lecture like you do the lecture today. Um, also, there's going to be that uh, chin up challenge right after that lecture. And just, to, you know, to check the dates, like make sure that we're all in the same page. Uh, so the last lecture, yeah, the last lecture will be on on uh, 1st of December, and that's Wednesday. Use all time. Well, again, I need to check it out, like how is, you know, where the lecture room is located at, but uh, it's going to be face-to-face -face lecture, and right after that, um, chin-up competition. And I'm going to make a video out of my chin-up uh, effort. So those of you that, again, would like to challenge me using an online option, you just uh, email your your video to me and then we will see who is the winner. So, yeah, so that was a question in um, in uh, the chat as well. And uh, no dancing in the last lecture. And that's simply because the last time it was not 100% success rate, eventually. It looked in the beginning that we were scoring 100%, but then somebody, which, which wasn't me, it was not me, definitely, I can guarantee you that, somebody came and entered incorrect answer. So the success rate eventually was a 98%, if I remember correctly, but not 100%. But again, you still have a few chances to make me dance, and that, uh, that will happen if you're going to score 100%, and you keep it 100%. Okay, so that's another challenge. And the dancing will be uh, this uh, victory dancing will be in that face-to-face um, -face lecture then. So those of you, like I said, if you're unable to travel, then you just follow the lecture using this usual online streaming option. Okay, so those are the announcements. So minor changes concerning the lecture number 11, and then conventional lecture in lecture number 12. At least that's this is my plan today. Well, no one knows what's gonna happen in terms of the COVID, um, possible COVID-related limitations, but uh, we'll see that, we'll see that. Okay, last week we looked a little bit about um, um, 
flexibility. We, we kind of closed the case about the flexibility of um, hydraulic oil or fluid. And we concluded that um, hydraulic is a, is a flexible component. And due to its flexibility, it's possible to compute the natural frequency associated to hydraulic circuit. And I explained that if you have a setup as shown in this picture, where there is a hydraulic cylinder such that there is a pressure applying both sides of the piston, and then the mass, which is uh, uh, lifted up and down, and this is uh, affected by gravity, the natural frequency of this kind of system can be computed such the way that is here ruled stiffness divided by mass. Uh, this is what you learned already in the high school, I think, this natural frequency. But in this case, how is that you can compute the stiffness? Well, the stiffness you can compute by knowing the dimensions of piston and piston rod, and then the volume in both I mean, corresponding side of the, the rod, to meet the piston, and then the effective bulk modulus. And the final the equation reads like it is shown here. This is something I'm expecting you to do in, um, well, last in class, not in class quiz, but the last weekly homework. So we are about to, you see that we are kind of wrapping up the course already. It, and it's, at least for me, it sounds like amazing because we started just very recently. And now this is already lecture ID 10. So two more lectures to go and then we're done. And when we, once we're done, then uh, there's only, I mean, once we're done with the lectures, then there's going to be one more week for a second midterm exam and that's it. Okay, let's continue with the summary from the previous lecture. There's something that is extremely important and it's playing extremely important part of this uh, hydraulic modeling is the first order differential equation you can use to describe pressure at any given time. So how is this equation? Well, this equation is such that there's a B dot. Well, if using the same notation we used to deal with in uh, multi-body system dynamics, I would say this would be better to mention as a P dot. Because remember, in uh, multi-body system dynamics, it was all the time Q, Q dot, Q dot, dot. And now, what we wanted to do here is that we wanted to express the P dot, which is equation that can be expressed such the way that there is effective bulk modulus, which physical interpretation is a flexibility. This is often, very often actually, asked in uh, midterm exams. So this is really the flexibility. Then we have a size of the volume, and then we have a flow rate in, flow rate out, all the flow rates in, all the flow rates out, and then possible change of the volume. And this is a component that takes a place or is non-zero in the case of um, actuators. Hydraulic cylinder is a good example. So using this equation or using this concept, which is called lump fluid theory, you can first of all divide your hydraulic circuit within the volumes where you are assuming pressure to be equally distributed. Most of the cases, this like discretization, if you want to use this sophisticated word, this discretization is obvious, so it's not complicated at all. An example of um, obvious cases is a, is a hydraulic damper. And a hydraulic damper is, um, is kind of like a hydraulic cylinder with the difference that there is a possibility that the fluid can travel from one damper to another. Okay. Uh, and this is a kind of simplified description of the, the damper. Of course, in, in real life, it's way more complicated and is not this kind of simple drilling which allows the fluid to travel back and forth. But it's a complicated mechanical system that depends on the pressure and so on. So, but anyways, the simple damper, it's a fair assumption to say that the pressure this corner is same that the pressure here and the pressure there because there's nothing within this volume that will introduce the pressure losses. No throttles, so the oil can travel freely within this volume. So it means that, you know, here we can use this first order differential equation to compute the pressure at any given time. And this pressure is then the function of flow rate in, flow rate out. And now, what we need to do here is that we need to make a decisions about the positive flow rate direction. 
We could say, we, uh, by the way, you can do this as you please. There is no limitation in this regard. But like in the multi-body system dynamics, you do your choice and you are just consistent with your choice. And not, let's say that now the choice could be that the flow rate is a positive direction is uh, the, like, like the one that I just uh, make the arrow. That would mean that when you look at this particular chamber, you know, flow is leaving. So there is no coming flow rate, but it's only the one that is minus in the size sign. And then, you know, there is um, this um, component that is associated to how the volume is changing. This time, because obviously when the positive direction is mentioned here, this uh, direction will compress fluid in this direction. So this should be positive in its sign. Okay, then here in the piston, well, on the other side of the piston would be more better way to express this. Now we here we have a flow rate in, but we have no leaving flow rate, so the equation would be like this. And and excuse me, the here you know this should be minus. This should be minus. Uh, and this should be then plus. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I could make my I made myself confused. So of course you know this is something we will practice by the way today. So this should be minus leaving coming hold on so why is that i get confused about this no this should be plus because you know if the piston positive direction is this one the positive direction will compress fluid and increase the pressure so this should be plus whereas here it should be minus sorry about the confusing anyways we're going to practice this later today so there are better examples than this. So again, you do the selection about the positive direction as you feel that is the best way to do it. And then you just keep, con you are consistent with your, uh, what your choice you made. And that's how it goes. Now here is this first order differential equation. You use this equation to compute from P dot, you compute it to P. And once you know the P, then you can compute how much the force is applying in this side of the piston and this side of the piston. And that's the force that is associated with this damper. So that's, in short, how it goes. In real hydraulic circuit, this discretization task is equally, most of the cases, equally simple than in the case of the damper. Because typically you need to discretize your hydraulic system such that you need to compute the, the pressure in each of the pipelines, each of the volumes of the systems. Uh, what difference yet those volumes are different hydraulic components, which are direction valve, well, different kind of flow valves, pressure valves, and so on and so forth. Usually the valves are the one that is breaking the line. And now if you keep that in your mind, then this discretization is fairly straightforward task to do. So. Here's a hydraulic circuit, which uh, you see that the positive directions of the flow rate are already expressed here. So now computing the pressure here would be very straightforward, would be the, like P1 dot, would be effective bulk modulus divided by corresponding volume size, and then this flow in, so QA in, this out, and when it is leaving, this is gonna be the one that is negative in the size. There is no change of the volume of this particular case. So that's it. That's your differential equation. Using this differential equation, you compare the pressure in this particular location of the hydraulic circuit. And that's the way you can proceed in your computing. Where is that you're proceeding? You're proceeding the next volume. And in the next volume, it's important to know the pressure because this is the one that is then applying here in the piston and you can get the force produced by this hydraulic cylinder once you know the pressure and corresponding cross-section areas. So that's in short, that's how it goes. Okay, so let me continue with my summary from last week. Um, we also look at the different uh, flow types. And we concluded that uh, we have two different type of the flows and the one that is dominating, the one that you can see frequently in the real life is the one that is uh, based on the turbulent flow. And the turbulent flow, 
the, remember there's a, this easy rule of thumb to remember the turbulent flow because in a turbulent flow these flow particles are whirling you can call them rotating so you call them rotating and i think that it helps you to remember it because this is what we discussed so much in the case of multi-body system dynamics particle rotation which is like a santa claus not this life not going to happen in this life but call it rotation if it makes it easier to remember and in the modeling perspective the important point of view is the fact that in turbulent flow pressure difference which is the delta p here and the flow rate are quadratically related whereas in a laminar flow which takes a place typically when the pressure difference is small you know then uh, the pressure difference at the flow rate are linearly related I promised, by the way, last week that I'm going to tell you how is that you can compute this parameter CL here, which is shown as like a little bit unclear way. And here are the few examples to you. So these are the pre-calculated tables, which allows you to compute this uh, CL compu uh, parameter. And CL parameter is then a function of the geometry of the, of the kind of the, like the throttle or the trilling where the flow is traveling back and forth. And is also the function of um, viscosity, as you see here. So viscosity is a part of the play. But I get, like I, I think that I mentioned this earlier to you that the viscosity is only important in theory, is only in, important in, ca in case of laminar flow. Whereas in a turbulent flow, it's not important. It's not important. It's not theoretically playing any factor at all. But in a laminar flow, it, it does. It does. And this is why. You know, you know that those of you that are specialized to um, kind of like um, motorsport, you know that it's, it's a good idea to warm up the engine before you start doing the racing. And that's simply because, you know, the, the viscosity of the oil changes radically in terms of the, uh, as a function of temperature. And in the cars, there's a lot of different kind of... Uh, Yeah, I don't want to use that that camera. Okay, so it looked that I'm back. Huh. All right, so let me just double check. It looked that I'm back in business. I still have a warning which says that the um something about this stream bitrate uh, maybe this is uh is it this related to my voice how is that uh, let me ask you this how is that you understand me so simple questions how is that you understand me Okay, so now it's okay. So we, you understand me. So great, great. I remember when we started um, a while ago, I, I used to have these technical issues all the time. And I know where is the problem. I, the problem is in my camera. Actually, it's not even my camera. It's somehow related to my laptop because, you know, obviously my laptop is not healthy, so it's not doing well. And I have these connection problems even when I'm using Teams. I have really fancy camera which I'm using. Oh, I get. Okay, so uh, camera will be changed. This one. Okay, so it looks okay. So it's all right. So I can see that my chroma key is not not really good, but that's okay. Other than that, it uh, it looks acceptable in my mind. So uh, do you guys think that I, I, I can? Um, okay, let me let me put this in a, a little bit of different side. 
like this. No, that's that's not the way to go. So it shows like a, my my messy office. Okay, so it's uh, not perfect, but it will do the job, I think. And I'm just gonna do the final thing, and I will try slightly change my chroma key to like uh, like this one. Clo no, 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 no. That's not the way to go. Definitely not the way to go. Okay, so it's it's all right. <clears throat> so we were we're back here. So what I would, what I was about to explain to you is that you know important matter in the case of laminar flow is that you know here again you know pay attention to this fact that the flow rate and the pressure difference is quadratically related. So. And that's regardless of what kind of uh, geometry you are dealing with. So these are just an example, just an example. So then uh, let me, oh, good old times, you guys are saying in a chat window. Well, I can tell you that you have no idea about the good old times. So I, I could give a lecture about the good old times, but maybe, um, maybe not today. Here are another geometries, but again, same stories are not making any difference whatsoever. And again, you know, why is it not making any difference? That's simply because the pressure rate and the flow, I mean, pressure difference and the flow rate are linearly related. Okay, so final thing, and then there's gonna be a one, one example. And where's my pointer here? You know, we discussed shortly this was very brief discussion about the different ideas and different ways that we can model uh, hydraulic components. And this is what I'm going to explain in details to you today. But I mentioned that we have, roughly speaking, three different options. We could use analytical equations, which is a pure, clear mathematics. And in the case of a total valve, analytical equation would be the one that is shown here. So this is a a throttle valve, and you see the parameters needed here are not too complicated, but they comes with a certain practical difficulties. You know, you need to know this discharge coefficient, which you could get from the pre-calculated tables, at least a certain level of accuracy you can get it. And then you need to know the diameter of the throttle. This already could be a bit of the problem because typically manufacturers are not releasing this kind of information. They do release information about the characteristics of the throttle valve and other components. So in that perspective, it could be even difficult to get this simple uh, parameter, like what is the size of the throttle? Like what is a hollow, this hole where the flow is traveling back and forth? Now, what we can do to make this more usable is that we can convert this analytical mathematical expression such the way that unknowns can be easily defined from manufacturer's catalog. And this is very straightforward procedure. What it means in a case of a throttle valve, that is simply that we can express the flow rate and the pressure difference such that there is something that is called semi-empirical parameter. And the semi-empirical parameter, when you look that in details, is exactly the one that is based on analytical expression. Why we do that? Well, we do that because typically the, the manufacturers are offering the different kind of curves that are describing how is the pressure difference versus the flow rate. And using those curves, we can automatically detect this unknown parameter that I will show you in a minute. So that is something that is called um, semi-empirical modeling approach. So we're getting started from the analytical expressions we modify them a little bit such that the unknowns can be defined from characteristic curves that are in turn offered by manufacturer's catalog. So that's how it goes in short. We get, you know, third option. As I said, that there are three different ways to do it. So the third option is a pure empirical models, which we hate big time. Why? Well, because we all love a simulation, so we love a computer-based approach. So we don't want it to do a lot of measurements or experiments to figure out the parameters or models. So, so we could, in theory, but that's kind of a labor-intensive way to go, so not our way. Okay, so here it is. 
So let's take an example. Uh, this is an example about, you know, how is it we can calculate the pressure in this kind of a very, very simple piece of hydraulic circuit. So this is not the entire circuit, but uh, a piece of circuit where there is a piston, excuse me, the cylinder, which is a one-way cylinder. So there is no uh, pressure or no fluid applying in a piston rod side. No pressure this side. So the only pressure that applies is this piston side here. And what we need to do here is that we wanted to express the, best, the pressure here as of any given time or compare the pressure any given time. So what we need to do then is that we need to apply this equation P dot and to that, that end we need to define the elastic, excuse me, the effective bulk models. We need to define the size of the volume. We need to take a look at what is the flow rate that is coming in. You know, that's obviously this one here. Is there a flow rate that is living? Not that I can see. And then we need to take into account the motion of the piston, which is the one that uh, can be defined like this. So this is how it goes. And I'm going to take a look at your, uh, yeah, this is a hydraulic jack. That's right. So this is a simple, simple hydraulic circuit. So there's a flow rate that is coming in and how much uh, this jack is capable to produce force to lift your car when you're changing your summer tires to be your winter tires. I don't know if you do that by yourself, but I just did it in my my car a while ago, so I was able to do it. No, it wasn't easy, but uh, made it. Uh, why it wasn't easy? Because uh, my car is old, like no limit, and it's so hard to lift it because the jack always goes up, but the car necessarily goes nowhere. I mean, they're st still standing in a crowd, and that's because of the rust. But anyways, back in the business. So the first thing, volume of the, this uh, system we wanted to study here. Okay, the volume, we can get it by taking into account the hose that is connected to this uh, jack or the cylinder. And then we need to take into account like how much there is a volume that is uh, in this particular location here. I don't know if you can see this clearly because I'm using the color that is not too visible, but there is a, this volume here. That is obviously X, which is measured from the bottom of the, of the cylinder to position where the piston is located at. That multiplied by cross-section area, which is mentioned here. Okay, now we can uh, compute the effective bulk models. And remember the effective um, bulk models. Uh, so you were guessing like, what is my car? No, no, it's not a Ford, but it's a, it's a car from um, far from last century. Let me tell you that. Okay, so um, so uh, effective bulk modulus is what we compute next. So the components needed is a description of uh, flexibility of fluid. Then we need to describe the flexibility of the hydraulic cylinder, this jack, and then the flexibility of the hose. All right. So we can uh, solve this one here by simply using a little bit of mathematical manipulation. And this is it. You just need to substitute the information about how rich it is this uh, hydraulic cylinder, what is the flexibility of the hose to this equation, and it will do the, the computing for you. All right. Final thing, we need to take this uh, volume change into account. This time the volume change is fairly simple because, you know, is the one that is affected by the velocity of piston to this direction multiplied by corresponding cross-section area. This is it. Now you just substitute everything to this differential equation, and here's your, not your pressure, but P dot. So what are you gonna do with the P dot? Well, you, with the P dot, you cannot compute the P, and then you can compute the, pre, I mean, the force produced by this hydraulic lift. Okay, so with that, so let's, uh, uh, look at a little bit about these uh, components like I promised. And I'm going to speed up a little bit because I can see for that I've been a bit slow today. And I really want to close the case of hydraulics uh, today. Throttle. Throttle is symbol, you know, this is where it's good to get started. So it's kind of like a component that there is typically no moving components whatsoever. This is the one that is introducing the pressure differences. Or another way around, you know, you know, flow that is traveling through this uh, throttle valve is trying to equalize the pressure difference. 
however you want to decide. Okay, so um, like I say, we will use this approach that is called semi-empirical modeling approach. And this, by the way, is, um, I want to give you like a news flash here, or marketing flash, if you, if you may. And this modeling approach was already developed um, more than a, okay, let me do the math, more than a, okay, roughly 30 years ago. And uh, this was initially developed, one of the developers for this modeling approach was a professor that you may know. His name is uh, Professor Heikki Handros. So if you look at his early publication, most of his papers are touching this modeling approach. And the modeling approach is kind of significant because it helps to define the unknown parameters. And still heavily used. Many of the commercial uh, modeling softwares are, if not fully used, then they at least have certain kind of uh, procedures copy paste from that approach. So that's that's uh, our Heike. So that's a nice story. I have a stories about other professors too, but that's going to be next week when we discuss about the flexible body. So then I have a story about other famous professors in LUT University. So now, like I say, what we're going to do here is that we're going to Get started from this analytical equation. We manipulate it. Not much to manipulate because this is kind of simple. But we're going to do it in a, or we can express it in a way that parameter is the one we can get from manufacturer's catalog. And this is exactly the one that, you know, if you substitute this one here, you lose no accuracy. So there's absolutely no loss of accuracy. In certain cases, the semi-empirical modeling approach might introduce certain loss of accuracy, but the, that drawback is compensated by the fact that you can get at least, at least certain kind of assumptions about the parameters, which otherwise would be very painful to get. Here's an example. You know, I have here, I made this by myself, but this could be from manufacturer's catalog, and in the next component is actually from the manufacturer's catalog. I have here a characteristic curve in which I have here y-axis, which is a pressure difference. So this is delta P. And then I have here x-axis, which is a flow rate. And uh, based on this characteristic curve, which could be offered by manufacturer's catalog, I need to create the mathematical representation of this uh, throttle valve. OK. So the first important observation is that I can see that this curve is quadratic. How? Well, because it's not linear. There are simply two options. So it's either linear, that's laminar flow, or quadratic, which is a turbulent flow. So obviously, this is a, a quadratic curve. So it means that I can use this, uh, this equation we looked at in a previous slide, this one here, this, to model this, this particular component. And this unknown parameters, I can get anywhere I want from this curve. So I just simply pick the one point in the curve and I substitute the corresponding information to this equation that I got from the previous slide, and that's my parameter. So it's simple like this. Let's take an example. Let's set that this point here, which seems to be obvious choice here. So let's select that there is a point where the, the pressure difference is 100 bars. And then the flow rate in the, that pressure difference is 30 liters per minute. OK, so 30 meters per, per minute. Let's substitute it there and convert that to SI units because we need to use SI units consistently here. So that needs to be divided by 60,000. And then, uh, then I'm going to take the 100 bar. So that's going to be here under the skew root. And that's going to be, of course, uh, 100 multiplied by 10 power 5 because of the bar. That's the bar. And when you do the math, this is your semi empirical parameter. And look at the units. What a pain. So these are very, very painful units. It makes it hard if you want to use something else than the SI units. So make sure you consistently use SI units because you use something else, your life will be very, very hard. OK, so we're almost there. So just a, one more thing, you know, we need, to, we need to take into account the fact that, you know, the flow can travel here if P1 is having the bigger numerical value than B2. 
but they can also travel the other way around because it's possible that the P2 is bigger than P1, and in that particular case, the flow is traveling backwards. All right? So we need to take something, we need to take that into account. That means, by the way, that the, you know, the first of all, it means that, you know, the pressure difference in a skew would have to be in apps. So we need to compute the apps from the pressure difference. Why? Because we don't want to deal with the imaginary numbers, which will take a place if this number under the skew root will be minus in a sign. So we don't want to go that direction. So it will be easier to say, okay, we're going to take an apps here. So it's always having the positive value. But we still need to take into account that the flow can travel in an opposite direction. How is that we can do that? Well, we can do that by using a sine function, which is a simple mathematical expression. That's the way that, um, you know, if I write it sine x, this is going, this is having the three different options. So it's having the value, which is a uh, minus one, if this x is having the value less than zero. It's having the value one, if x is equal than zero, and one if x is bigger than zero. So that's what it is. That's the sine function. Now that takes care of the, of the different possibility of the flow, flow traveling. All right, and we're done, and we're done. So that's our first component. So that wasn't difficult at all. Next one is more difficult because next is a typical component you see in hydraulics. A typical component in a perspective that you see, first of all, you see that there is a, a moving component, spool or puppet. And you need to figure out what is the position of that moving component. And then you can figure out how much flow is traveling through that particular component. So there is two steps. And this is where my first in-class quiz will be. By the way, I'm sorry that I'm explaining this lengthy uh, having this lengthy explanation without having any in-class quizzes, but now come back to, to listen to me, uh, because the, there's going to be just a few more slides, and then uh, there's in-class quiz, and there is a um, question as well. Quadratically related. Yep, that's uh, that's what it is. Oh, I think that what confuses is this, because it says that Q is then let's put it here x and then delta p. Uh, so why do my lecture notes say mm, quadratically related? Okay, so, so let me try to explain it. So this is a relation you can see in a turbulent flow. And this means that, you know, you could express this in a such the way that this is a q power two equal than x uh, delta p. And this is where the quadratic relation is coming because this delta p here is under the skew root. So, so that's where it is coming from. So simply this is a nonlinear relation, second order nonlinear relation. So it's not the linear relation. So hopefully that clears the, the matter. Okay. Now back to the direction valve. We can, oh, by the way, we can discuss that more in a uh, team session right after this lecture. Now, direction valve. Okay, this is where you, I mentioned earlier that you don't really see much of a development in the hydraulics. And this is kind of true and not true because uh, yes, there are quite a bit of developments in the hydraulics, particularly what comes in the usability of hydraulics. Okay, thanks. So this um, comments through the chat window is now done. Turbulent flow, turbulent flow. That's right, the one where the particles are whirling, rotating, if you want to say that. Okay, so I said earlier that uh, I don't see much of a development in the hydraulics. And yes, there is a development in the hydraulics. There is this, this digital hydraulics that I'm about to explain to you. And uh, there is also quite a bit of development what comes in the usability. Because it used to be the case that the direction valve where you need to move the spool back and forth, those were mechanically operated. And at the moment, it's hard to see these mechanically operated valves. You can see those in the trucks and some simple applications, but in a mobile machinery, not so much. And they are typically now uh, operated by um, by solenoids, magnets, elect electronics in brief. 
uh, that makes a huge difference because then you don't need to put these uh, direction valves to be closed to an operator, but they could be located far from the operator. Uh, that's why the cabins, they look very different now compared to how that they look a while ago. Let me give you a proof on that. So this is um, two forest doctors. The one that is uh, having the label Valmet something. Don't know when this was uh, produced, but roughly um, at the time that I was young, let's put it this way. And uh, now when you look at the, the mechanical structure, the mechanical solutions used in this here, when you look at, you know, when you have an overview about the hydraulics, it's not that different than the one that is really the state of the art um, forest structure, which is shown in here in the right hand side. You know, and you can see that clearly because if you take a close look about, you know, this particular location here, there's a four bar mechanism and there's a hydraulic chute and they're operating that four bar mechanism. Then there's a lift arm, which is operated by hydraulic cylinder here. So the solution and hydraulic concepts, they don't look that much of a difference. But there is a huge difference when you step into capping of these two tractors. This is how the capping used to look like. Of course, this is old, so it's not shiny anymore. But you can see that um, this is operated by this kind of shaft. This kind of like... Um, you know, bars that you that are mechanically connected to direction valve. And direction valves are typically, I think that I need to change the color to make this a bit more visible to you. Th this is a plug of a direction valve. So they're very close to operator. You see that there is a huge hose that is coming near to operator. And you can just imagine how nice it is to operate the machine like that. Ergonomics is non existing, in short. And this is how this new version of the same machine look like. So there is, you know, pleasant to sit here because there is a small joysticks. These are the ones you use to control the, the crane here. So, so yeah, so it, it's, you know, ergonomics is absolutely beautiful. And you can have a different features that are easy to operate. You can in also introduce certain levels of automation here, but let's see, at least it's possible to do so. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's another difference. That, that's another difference, which is, by the way, interesting to discuss about this, uh, that uh, if something goes wrong, you can fix it here. Yes, you can, you can. And uh, whereas here, you need to ask an, an expert to do it for you. I mean, if something goes wrong, that is the case. But, you know, I'm still claiming that the reliability is much higher in the current product that it used to be all times and i'm saying that because you know look at think about the cars well uh you don't know this by an experience but i can tell you by an experience that um when i was in your age you know, the, the cars used to have a lot of different kind of difficulties mechanicals but the others too so uh and those kind of they were fixable but there was a lot of problems Today, it's hard to fix a problem, fix the problem if you're facing difficulties in your car, but there is a few problems. This is what I'm claiming. I have no proofs here, but this is my personal experience. Let's discuss about that after that tune-up competition. Okay. Now, like I said, now what we're going to do here now is that we're going to first introduce the model that describes the motion of this, this moving component spool typically particularly in direction valve is a spool that is moving back and forth. And, uh, and then we know how much flow is traveling. This is what we looked last week as well. So let's just moving on. Okay, so this is this mechanical, mechanically operated direction valves. So, uh, so we have here this shaft we learned, or we saw in a previous picture. This is then connected to the spool. And the spool is connecting different ports together. And this, like a drawing symbol for this kind of direction valve is the one that is shown here. So uh, when uh, the spool is in the middle position, you see that there is no flow traveling at all. So this is completely, everything is plugged. You push this uh, spool 
a little bit in the uh, you know, left hand side direction so you're going to connect the pressure and a so you're going to have this connection here so this is a pressure this is a and then the b will be automatically connected to tank and you push this another direction is another way around so that's how it works now this spool configuration and this land drum configuration land is the one that is blocking the the flow traveling from uh, from one board to another. That configuration is very important in terms of the modeling as well. Also very important in terms of the usability. Now, uh, here is a simple configuration of direction valve. Well, you know, again, I have this pressure that could be connected to A if you're pressing your spool to go the positive direction, or if you're pushing them to go the negative direction, it could be connected to B too. Then, if you push your spool to go this direction, then uh, obviously P is connected to tank. And then if you push it in this direction, then through this drilling here, A is connected to tank. So the drawing symbol for this is what? Well, I, this is not in class quiz, so I need to tell you this. So it's the one that is shown here. Because we are assuming that there is a zero overlapping here in the land. And we are assuming that there is no leakage here. There will be leakage in the real life, but we assume that there's no leakage, and that's why the middle connection is such that all the ports are disconnected. Now, these lands can have a very different configurations, and here are the few examples. You know, the land could be shorter than the, than the canals or channels that need to be connected, and that means that in a middle position, there is a leakage all the time. So that's that's possible to do that. I haven't really seen, I don't know why you would do this in a real life, but this is a one possibility. It could be possible that the land is just blocking the, the, the flow to travel in a middle position, or it could be the possible that the lands are significantly bigger, such the way that you need to seriously move the piston in order to introduce some, some flow. This having a very different kind of characters in terms of usability of the direction valve. So here is a picture which shows that how is a spool position, valve opening, if you may, spool position versus the flow having the same pressure difference all the time, how they're looking at. You know, if this is a land having zero overlapping, then as soon as you're moving your spool, even a little bit of left and right, they started to be flowed through this direction valve immediately. That's what's going to happen. But if you have these positive lands here, like lands that are clearly bigger than they need to be, then you need to move your, your spool a little bit and nothing happens. You need to move it more and nothing happens. Finally, they comes in a position that the flow started to travel. So this is a one scenario. The scenario that is very often used, that this relation about the valve opening and the flow is proportional, so not linear but proportional. And these are the top of the valves that are called proportional direction valves. Why it would make sense to have this proportional opening? And the, by the way, the example about the proportional opening is the one that is shown here. It becomes to be a little bit messy, so let me try to clear this a little bit for you. All right, getting better. All right, so uh, this was the one that was this proportional. Well, the idea of this proportional valve is that it can be used to, you know, in a, in a kind of like in a task where you need to high precision, I mean, accuracy to, to have certain kind of machine in a close to where it need to be. And then also you need to, or you simultaneously want to have a fast or a very high full speed. So if you have the valve fully open, there is a high full speed, whereas in a very close to zero operation, the motion is insignificant, very small. So you can have a system where simultaneously you can have very accurate precision uh, motion, and then you can have very fast motion. So this is a excavator could be a good example of that kind of system. Okay, but now what it means in the terms of modeling, how is that we can do the modeling then? Well, first thing is that we need to make the model of uh, the spool position, all right? 
spool position is typically modeled by using a first order delay equation. This, by the way, is my first in class quiz. And again, sorry that I'm this late with my first in class quiz today. Okay, so delay equation that is uh, then proportional, not proportional, but a function of a input signal. So let me explain what is that we should learn from this. Well, let me let me get started by first showing you how is that uh, what is the difference between electric signal and uh, spool position. You know, here is a um, time, and here is a control signal. Let's say that this is a first control signal, which is, let's say, voltage. So it could be possible that you have zero voltage, like zero control that is coming from those joysticks. So it meaning that the joystick is in a middle position. What you can do then is that by software programming or other techniques, you can introduce here a step. So you can act, increase that the, the control signal to having the one step moving from fully closed to set, say fully opening, like that. Now, because of the spool is having certain inertia, spool cannot do this kind of jump. You know, none of the mechanical components can do the jump. You know, I cannot take my bend and move it like rapidly like the other direction. There is always a smooth behavior, even though that it might look that I'm doing that rapidly because of my, you know, I'm so kind of like uh, using so much power, but you know, always is smooth in when you take a close look about that. There's an acceleration and deceleration. So what that means in terms of spool. So if I make the spool to follow this input signal, this control signal, the spool cannot have this jump, but it's following this by using this kind of uh, acceleration and deceleration. So it looked like S-curve here. This S-curve is the one that we can model by using this first order differential equation, which is called delay equation. So it's, it's describing the inertia of the spool without knowing the real inertia properties of the spool, without knowing how much the magnets or solenoid is eventually capable to introduce the forces. So it's simple delay equation, which is a good example about, again, about the semi empirical modeling approach. Okay, so this equation here describes spool position, even though that is a bit confusing because components we have here is an input signal, this one here, spool actual position, and then something that is called time constant. Time constant, you can get from, you guess right, from the manufacturer's catalog. So this is a good example about the semi empirical modeling approach. So, how you can get this uh, time constant? You can get this time constant from the, the manufacturer's catalog because they usually offer something that is called border diagram, which shows how fast your valve is, how rapidly it can react to different situations. Let's take a look at an example momentarily, but uh, that's how you can model the spool position. Now, once you have a spool position, and then you can model the flow rate through your components simply by using this semi-empirical approach. And in your semi-empirical approach, your flow rate is a function of the valve opening, U here, valve position, another way to say it, and the semi-empirical parameter that you can get from, yes, manufacturer's catalog. This is how it is in simplest form. But if you want to make it more sophisticated, then as it is mentioned here in the text, you can make it in a way that if the pressure difference, let's put it this, pressure difference at the flow rate, when the pressure difference is small, less than one bar, we can have this linear relation. Now, this is not the Peter Flip drawed, but you know, there's a linear relation and then quadratic relation. And the switch could be roughly one bar. This is computationally more pleasant than pure quadratic relation because of this uh, infinity that you can see when the when you're approaching to zero. Finally, my in-class quiz is this. Now let me see where we are. So we have 52 viewers today. Now we already got some answers in our in-class quiz. So physical interpretation of equation below. So is a pressure drop due to a valve 
flow through valve, spool position, number of ports in valve. Oh my God, you guys getting started by 100%. No, there's a, I mean, I'm sorry, the first one was a 93. And then 100% again. Another 100%. <laughs> oh, this will be really something. So yeah, I, I'm not scared because, uh, so if it if it's 100% less, so I'm going to down. So it's not a problem. I mean, it's a problem. Of course, it's a big problem to me, but, uh, you know, I'm still confident, kind of confident that it's not going to happen today. But we'll see that momentarily. So uh, um, let me see. I have, okay, the numbers is increasing rapidly. So I have 40, excuse me, uh, yeah, 41 answers, 42 answers. Uh, 52 views. Okay, so uh, probably, and by the way, there was a question uh, from email, like how is it, somebody was still wondering how is, the, how is it um, is possible to log into the Socrates system. The student ID number without zeros in the beginning, that will do the trick, without zeros in the beginning, so you can have an access to Socrates system. But it's kind of getting late now because, you know, it's uh, unrealistic to get the extra points this late. So you can get the extra points if you follow them. You do the in-class quizzes pretty much consistently during the course. All right. So how is the situation today? Um, 52. I think that I'm happy with that. Seems that I have my, um, you know, the number of views is pretty steadily, pretty consistently that uh, 50 is something. So uh, it's not increasing, but it's not decreasing either. So it's it's okay. I would like to have more views for sure, for sure. I would like to, each of the ones that would like to pass the course, I would like them to follow the stream because this is the way to pass the course. Um, okay, would you like to learn my, uh, my guess here? My guess is this, 65. 65 and as soon I'm going to click there, you know, uh, I'm going to show you the results and I'm going to keep my hands visible all the time. So it's not me if somebody's coming late and enter the answer incorrectly. So here's secret Socrative and 54 answers, 55. Here's when I'm going to close it. What? Oh my God, you know, you guys made me scared because it looked that, you know, this uh, green bar is going all the way to end, but not quite, not quite. So, it's full position, it's full position like we discussed. And now there's more incorrect answers. So, all right. So let me take this off and let me explain the correct answer to you. Now, this one here is the one that is representing this full position. It's a little hard to see like how, you know, where the physical components are, but this is simply a delay equation, which introduced that the thing that if you have this kind of step, you know, this equation is following the step with delay. Uh, sorry that this is so unclear drawing, but with delay like this. How much is this, this delay? That is defined by this time constant, this one here. Where is that you can get this time constant? You can get that from the manufacturer's catalog. All right. Now, different scenarios, depending on the spool positions. These are the full model of the direction valve. So first of all, you compute the direct position of the spool. Once you know the position of the spool, then you can com compute the flow rate in different scenarios. If they're, they're a positive direction, if there is a zero displacement in the spool, when we are assuming that there is no leakage whatsoever, and when it is having the negative direction. So it's simply connecting different ports together. That's what it is. That's the hydraulic modeling. Okay, another, so we learned that the, most of the currently used hydraulic direction valves are operated um, by electronics. And then, uh, you know, the, of course, there's a, there are quite complicated structures. There's a pilot uh, spools and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different details, which we are not going to take a look at here. 
Another interesting thing, which I would like you to be aware of, is uh, digital hydraulics, which seems to be somewhat um, promising uh, technology. I don't know if you guys are following the business news, but uh, I think it was a couple of weeks back, there was a story about the company called uh, Norhydra, and how is that they would like to find their way to Helsinki stock. And um, this is a company that is specialized to digital hydraulics, which is, in my mind, something that makes a great deal of sense. So what is this digital hydraulics then? So let me first explain it in a, in a way that you can get an idea of what is a digital hydraulics. And then I'm going to speculate a little bit about, you know, what could be a future of the digital hydraulics. By the way, not my speculation, but what I learned from my colleagues from Tampere University of Technology, which is no longer, of course, Tampere University. Okay, so what I would like you to do is that I would like you to take a look at this uh, YouTube video, and I'm going to copy paste. Uh, how is that I can give this to you such that you don't need, you do not need to type this. Can I just, um, I think the easiest would be to do it like this. Here's the link. But don't go to, to check it out this video right now because listen to what I would like to say to you. And then later, this video is only 50 seconds, five zero seconds. So it's not taking much of your time. It's giving you news flash about how is a digital hydraulics. Okay, conventional hydraulics is the one that there's this moving component. So there's a one spool that is connecting different ports. And depending on the spool position, the flow rate can be bigger or smaller. Right. That's what the conventional hydraulics is doing. Now, in the digital hydraulics, you're replacing this kind of like continuous spool motion by a number of on-off valves, on-off solenoid valves, puppet valves, if you may. And these puppet valves can be opened or closed, but they can be on one puppet valve can be only be closed or fully closed or fully open. Now these valves can have a different kind of sizes. And now when you have more of these on-off valves, then you can introduce, um, you know, controllability that would be otherwise hard to get. And once you look at this uh, video, you will learn that, you know, this is first of all an example. I, I made the screenshot of this video. So there's a three different kind of, three different size of puppet valves. One is uh, such that there's a one liter per minute, second is a two meters per, li per minute, and then the four meters per, four, four liters per minute. And now you can close and open those in a different scenarios based on the, the control scheme. And now this shows this table here, which too is made by copy paste from this uh, video. You can see like what it means to have a different number of valves, like how many different combinations you can receive, how many different like, uh, or you can say like spool position, if you compare that to conventional hydraulics, how many different spool positions you can reach. So if you have one valve, that's, you know, of course, very simple. So it's a two different combinations. So if you have two is four, and then you started to increase rapidly. So if you have 16 valves, then uh, the number of combination is uh, 65,000. So that's uh, kind of like, how can I put it in another way? So I'm just, uh, if I think about, you know, remember when we look at this flow rate, spool position, how is this spool position? Let's say spool position. Remember we, we made it in a way that this was like, uh, you know, it could be proportional like this. Well, sorry that the drawing is like this, this hard, but kind of like when you look at that, this made by digital hydraulics, when you have a close look, it's like a steps, small steps that makes it happen. And if there is uh, enough these steps, then it's practically continuous. It's a practically continuous. Okay, so that's uh, digital hydraulics. Now a little bit of speculation. Okay, well, first of all, the one thing that I would like, but I forgot to mention is that you know, like mentioned in that video, they say that you know, advantages associated with digital hydraulics is zero leakage. Yeah, that's easy to believe because the puppet valves can be made such that there's zero leakage. Whereas the spool valves, mm, 
it's going to be hard because in real life there there's always a certain number of leakage and you can see that that the, you know the middle position could be something that the that the that the, the system is not standing still but is slowly moving to a certain direction they say that it's possible to create an accurate control based on digital hydraulics which is easy to believe and it um, introduced the less power losses okay let's discuss about that in a little while and then they said that uh, the drawback associated to digital hydraulics is complicated algorithms control algorithms because you need to use computers to control these uh, these different um, possibilities particularly if it is like 18 billion so it's like huge a number what is this so it's like really a lot okay power loss so this is important because soon we're going to discuss about the pumps and hydraulics having this serious drawback that the pump is keep on producing the energy to system is it needed or not and you know these diesel valves they really don't solve that problem yet but it's possible that you could combine digital direction valve to digital pumps and that would mean that in a pump you will make a decision whether or not you know it could be like piston pump and piston pump is the one that piston is going back and forth and you can every time the piston is moving back and forth you can make a decision whether or not you're pumping flow to system or you don't pump flow to system and this could be something that could introduce serious uh, um, I mean advantages in terms of energy consumption yes there is a there is a digital valves that are commercially available already so like I mentioned this uh, nor nor hydro sorry that this is strong Finnish uh, way to just to, to pronounce it so but this nor hydro is the one company that is doing it so is it making a design to be more simple in terms of maintenance and so on and so forth this is a little hard to say but this seems that obviously that this is uh, one of the advantages it's kind of like new trends in the hydraulics that seems to have a potential potential but is can we really materialize this potential to um, better design or simple design or better maintenance that I, I my answer for that is that that's a case dependent and I cannot say anything like every single case you can get a better maintenance I, I cannot say that but I guess that you can get the more flexibilities and this is important because this is the flexibility could be software based flexibility you know you know this is what i'm going to tell you in my last lectures where i'm explaining you what is the role of the simulation in the practical applications and uh, there's a huge trend that the business is moving from material flow processing to something that is a data and knowledge based business and uh, this is a good example in that too so sorry that this is unclear explanation but i will get back to that in my last lectures um so uh, so then there's another uh, yeah variable speed you know we get back to this pump business uh, but the idea about this digital pumps is that okay I, I need to get back to that when i'm explaining when i'm showing how the piston pumps looks because you can you can run the piston without making much of a work and you can make a decision whether or not the, the energy is needed in a system by using some clever thinking not thinking software based on algorithms uh, this could be the way to introduce some serious uh, improvements in energy efficiency um, but we get back to the pumps uh, momentarily and you guys are you guys are uh, answering your questions already so I'm not going to take a look at that. Next in class quiz is this digital direction valve consists of a spool controlled by a computer, a number of on off valves, a spool controlled by a magnet, a spool that moves incrementally. So, so this is my next in class quiz. And I don't know what's up with me because it seems that every other week I'm like extremely slow, like low, so slow that it makes no slim limit. And today I can see that I'm very slow. Don't know why. 
I feel talkative, I guess. I don't know. It's been an easy day for me, so maybe that's I have too much energy for you guys. Could be. Okay, so uh, the digital direction valve consists of, uh, and here are the choices, a spool controlled by a computer, so that's a single spool. A number of on-off valves, a spool controlled by a magnet, spool that moves incrementally. So, these are the four choices. And then uh, the next thing is that I will show you how is that that you can get these semi empirical parameters for a direction valve. Yeah, maybe the, the coffee is another explanation. I have a coffee now with me, so this is a real coffee, not um, water. Could be. Okay, guys, so. Um, let me see the number of answers. I have 33, so somewhat low. I'm going to wait you a little while. And then a uh, couple more things. So the next one is uh, pressure relief valve, which I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to let you that you know, as a reading assignment. And then we're going to discuss about um, cylinder, which is symbol component. And then the one that is more complicated component is a pump. How is it we can model a pump? And of course, we have roughly two different choices. We can um, have a, a fixed volume pumps or variable volume pumps. And then the modeling uh, strategy will be very different depending on uh, what kind of pumps you're looking at. And now there's my, my man, so he's saying 100% success rate. Could be, it could be. Could be the case. All right, so uh, for soon it's going to be 50 answers, couple more, one more, and then it's 50. By the way, I forgot to check the winners from the last game. Sorry, my mistake. My mistake. I need to take it at that. Take a look at that later. So we have 52 answers. So I think we're I feel we're done, so I can show this to you. So, last guesses, and then we go. All right, so success rate today in our second in-class quiz is um, this much. Disappointment, 66. <laughs> That's a honestly a minor disappointment that's okay and it's a disappointment because in digital hydraulics we don't deal we do not deal with the spool we do not you know there's a puppet is and it's on a valve and that's why you know a c and d are incorrect because we don't deal with this motion of the spool spool is not there in the digital hydraulics so <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's move on. So let me show how is that you can get these parameters needed in a direction valve model. So here is uh, the CV parameter. And this is, by the way, copy paste from the manufacturer's catalog. So here is uh, you know what is mentioned from the manufacturer's catalog that there is a valve where the nominal flow is uh, 25 liters per minute when the pressure difference is uh, 35 bars. And, you know, this is pretty much the information that I need to define this CV parameter. And I can see that, you know, here, this opening and the flow rate is linearly related. So I don't need to use any quadratic description or anything like that. So the linear will do the job. So I simply introduce, uh, you know, this parameter, I'm gonna substitute it here. And then in a fully opening, I can see that in a fully opening, that's my voltage here. So is uh, the number I can get it there. And the pressure difference was 35 par. So that's where the 35 par comes. And here's my semi empirical parameter. And look at this unit, it's uh, like serious nightmare. Very difficult to get. Second parameter that I need is this border diagram. And the border diagram is the 
here too, this is a border diagram. Uh, this is um, a diagram that shows how is a uh, how fast is the direction valve. By the way, the you know how fast you can do the hydraulics is roughly. I would say that it can be go all the way to maybe 40 hertz, something like that. Because every now and then there's an idea that can we uh, use a hydraulic cylinder as a damper? And in a certain perspective, you can use that as a damper, but as an active damper, then the vibration needs to be having the low natural frequency. That I would say that it would, would be okay if you have a frequency 50 hertz or something like that, then maybe you can use a hydraulics to as an active damper. But other cases, it's going to be hard to do so. But back to this. So this border diagram shows um, how fast is the spool. Uh, this is a uh, this um, how fast is the spool is is made by using an experiment where you're controlling the spool moving from fully closed to fully um, I mean from left to right such that there is this sign signal curve here. And what they do in this experiment is that they they changing this sign to be having the higher and higher frequency. So it gets started with a very small, I mean, the low frequency, and then the frequency gets higher and higher and higher. And at a certain point, the spool is unable to follow the, this control signal because of the forces that it's in the use and because of the inertia. Now, how well it follows the signal can be seen in this curve here. So this is the curve that shows how well what how, how well it follows the signal when there's a fully open so this is 100% opening 100% from left 100% to right and this is how fast you can do it and this so that okay it's doing really well so it can follow with no problem whatsoever this is by the way the difference between the actual spool position and the control signal that's what it's showing so it's a difference between the actual position and where you want it to be at B. No, there's no difference whatsoever in the 10 hertz. There's a minor difference, and the, the spool is left a little bit behind when the frequency is 20 hertz, but not significantly. It's still okay. But now you see that when the difference is becomes to be, I mean, when the, the frequencies are 40 hertz, then the difference becomes to be pretty significant. And I'm using the number that is roughly here when I'm saying, okay, now the difference, this difference here is uh, when the difference is uh, in angle, and in angle wise of 45 um, degrees, then is a uh, two large difference. So that's number is of 35 here. So this is 35 hertz. So this is where I get my frequency. Now the second curve here shows how is that the rule valve is doing it when it is not fully open, but only 5% open and 5% closed. So 5% left, 5% right. And you can see that it's doing much better in that case. In that case, actually, the frequency seems to be... What is this number? 80 hertz. That's a lot. How can I put this back? Yeah, like that. 80 hertz. So that's how you can get these parameters needed. Okay, with that, let me... So, uh, pressure relief valve. I'm not going to touch that in details. I'm going to move on to cylinder and then the pump. Oh my God, I can see that I'm kind of running out of the time today. So I'm very, very slow today. Here's uh, how it goes in a semi empirical modeling approach. You know. If you want to model um, pressure, what is this? A pressure relief valve, yes. That's what we're discussing in analytically. So you need to use this equation. So this is an equation that tells you the spool position. And now I have here parameters that for sure will be difficult to get. So this is a mass of the spool, spring coefficient. You know, this is there's a pretension of the spring. Our oh, pretension, I think that it was mentioned uh, here. So the, here's a pretension. Then there's a flow force that is affecting the spool. There is a, this is this uh, pretension of the force. It's pretension of the force. So the pressure force is also applying. Though those are the, all the forces that are applying the spool. And it's going to be very hard to use this kind of equation of motion to solve the X here. 
which if you were able to do so, can be then substituted at this flow equation here, because this is a function of the spool position. But here too, you know, there's a lot of parameters that are somewhat difficult to get. So now what was the Hecke proposing then a while ago? He said that let's use this again, this semi-empirical modeling approach to make this in a way that these unknown parameters can be obtained from manufacturer's catalog. And you can learn the details when you look at the lecture note or early, early you know, the publication that Hecke made 30 years ago or so. So it, uh, he converted that uh, equation, this equation of motion to be this first order differential equation and the flow rate then was depending on this first order differential equation. Unknown parameters, yeah, you can get it from manufacturer's catalog. That's the story in short. And then cylinder. And what time it is? We have five minutes. I think we have more because we have a, a little bit of um, technical difficulties. Yeah, so it uh, would be nice if uh, if um, digital hydraulics becomes to be more common. So uh, no need to deal with the spool position. That would be nice because you could use digital hydraulics also as a pressure relief valve because pressure valves and flow valves uh, they all can be made digitally so it's possible but of course the real reason to use it is um, I mean I, I mean at least in my mind that the biggest potential is related to the fact that they could be used to introduce a better energy efficiency that would be a big deal Um, digital hydraulics, uh, so there was another comment about the digital hydraulics. Yeah, it could be faster too. Now this is actually something that I cannot really tell you as a fact because I don't know how fast you can make these, uh, these on-off valves, but it's my understanding that you can make them faster than this conventional spool because in a spool you have a bigger inertia, you have different forces that are applying the, the spool. So it, I would I would think that you can make it faster, and that's why, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure about that because my colleague in Tampere mentioned that because the valves can be that fast, this decision you make in a pump, whether or not you produce the energy to the system, that can be then reflected in a direction valve, so they can be already seeing what happens in a pump, and to make that happen, you need to be fast, so you need to be extremely fast. So I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Okay, so it seems that you guys are getting excited about the digital hydraulics. We can discuss more about digital hydraulics in a team session right after this, but now, cylinder. And cylinder story is short, because cylinder is converting pressure to be mechanical force. That's in short. So here is a typical cylinder. So we have pressure that is applying here in a piston side pressure that is applying in a piston rod side. These pressures are multiplied by corresponding cross-section areas. That's your force. Except that there's one more tiny force, which um, is coming because of the ceiling. You know, there, you'd have to use a ceiling to make sure that there's no flow traveling from piston side to piston rod side. And you can make it happen by introducing ceilings. Also, you need to have a ceiling such the way that the press, I mean, the flow is not traveling off from the cylinder. So because of these ceilings, you have a friction forces too. And these friction forces, um, they can be a little bit of nasty to model because um, they can easily introduce a behavior that is called stick-slip behavior. And stick-slip behavior is something you can see in a daily life a lot. You can hear that in a daily life, let, put it, let me put it this way. You can hear that in a daily life a lot, because whenever you're moving a table from one place to another, let, let me see if this is making this noise. Yeah. You hear when I'm moving, you know, there's a table in my office, I'm moving this table. You hear this noise? So the noise, if you listen this carefully, the noise is like making this kind of like, um, not the continuous noise, but something that is like uh, on and off all the time. Where this is coming from? 
it is coming from this thick slip behavior where the static friction is a bigger than the sliding friction. Uh, this is where you can see that a lot. You can hear that in the hydraulic cylinders too. So sometimes they make this kind of noise as well. And that's a clear example about that. Still moving my table a little bit. Sorry that this demonstration is not so great here in uh, streaming as it would be in face-to-face -face lecture. But anyways, you got, you got the idea. Typically, this friction should contain this stick-slip behavior as well. And that means simply that, you know, if you look at the friction, uh, sorry, this is velocity, velocity and friction force. The friction force is having the higher static friction. When you're capable to make the system to slide, then the friction goes downwards. So the force that is associated with the friction reduces. And then it started to increase as a function of velocity. But because this downhill here, it causes the situation that it's first very hard to move the system. So you need a lot of forces to move the system. But once you're capable to move the system, it kind of jumps here because the friction is low here. But because, um, you know, because uh, then what happens is that, you know, your system kind of jumps in one location, the velocity will stop and it goes back here. And that's where this thick slip is coming from. It can be in the, kind of like the way to, to say it is that, you know, there's like, I don't know if this is going to be a good picture, but no, this is not going to be a good picture, but there's like a beam that you're moving to left hand side. So every now and then it sticks and every now and then it slides. Sorry that this 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 um, description was not clear. Anyways, so this is the only component that is a little bit of unknown. Others are clear and uh, simple to describe. Now, one way to describe this friction is that maybe we can use a pre-described curve based on the measurements. So here is a measurements which I'm going to explain to you in a minute. And then that measurements could be a function of the net force produced by a cylinder. And then the net force multiplied by, by efficiency. Efficiency typically is very having the high numerical value, let's say 0 0.95. So hydraulic cylinders, the efficiency is very good, fairly good. But uh, the stick slip behavior, you can see that clearly here. But when you look at this, how is um, friction? This is a friction force. Sorry that this isn't finished, but the font is, font is so small that you cannot even read it by yourself. And then this is a velocity. And you can see that this is, this is the ones that are based on the measurements. And of course, you know, it seems that there is a hard to measure what are the forces when the velocity is zero. But obviously you can see that they are kind of jumping on, jumping on here. And then there's a question about this. Is this a stick slip uh, worse than a pneumatic cylinders? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking that it may be not so bad in a pneumatics because in a pneumatics that the ceilings used are not as strong as they are in a hydraulics. But again, this is something that I cannot say as a hundred percent certainty. So I was, but in a pneumatics, hmm, but in a pneumatics, I think that this number here is lower in a pneumatics, so it could be significant too. Hmm. Pneumatics is not really my strongest suit, so I cannot really say much for that. Sorry. So, so we were here. Oh, and I see that also the time is up. So we never had a time to look at the pumps, which um, will be an interesting topic because we're going to discuss about load sensing pumps and uh, kind of like a current technology used in the pumps. Also a little bit about the technology that was used when I was young. Yep, application dependent. Okay, guys, so I'm going to close this streaming and I'm going to see you in a minute in a team session. So, you know, sorry about the technical difficulties in the middle. And uh, yeah, we have two more lectures to go. And like I said, next Wednesday, no lectures, but the lecture will be on Thursday. We'll email, I will send your notification on that through the model. And then remember that the last lecture, which is the 1st of December, that's face to face. And right after that, chin up challenge. And I can tell you guys that I'm prepared. I am prepared. 
Okay, with that, let me close the streaming and uh, see you guys soon in uh, Teams. Now, where is my pointer here? Okay, question. Uh, one question still left. You mean? Uh, no, no, we did not have. A, you know, one question is missing, but we. Uh, that's gonna be next week. Sorry about that. And the next, because the next in class quiz needs some time, so it's gonna be. It needs a full explanation about the pumps, and I don't have a. I kind of have a time to do it, but I, I don't. I want to keep let you off the hook. So the next week.